And welcome back to our talk show, and we will begin our second session for today's policy dialogue. Where in the second session, we'll be discussing more on the global food and energy crisis and also the impacts on the palm oil sustainability roadmap. And once again, I would like to invite everyone here to please also propose your questions, which you can type in the Slido feature by scanning the barcode that is available on your screen and also by accessing the Slido link that is available or that you can find on your table, ladies and gentlemen. So without further ado, as you enjoy your dessert and probably your lunch, I would like to start our second session by inviting up onto the stage our speakers for our second session. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, our first panelist, Mr. Wisnu Lombarduinanto, the representative from the Director General of Multilateral Cooperation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Indonesia. Once again, I would like to call upon Mr. Wisnu Lombar Duinanto. Oh, it appears that Good he afternoon. is here yes. online. I'm sorry. Yes. Good afternoon. <laughs> Selamat siang. Maaf. I was informed that you'll be here offline, but no. But thank you for joining us virtually, Mr. Wisnu. Next, please join me in welcoming our second panelist, Professor Dr. Heri Purnomo, the senior scientist and also Deputy Country Director of C4 ICRAF Indonesia and also professor at IPB University. Good afternoon, Professor. Please do take a seat. Whichever seats you would like to choose. Thank you. And our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Miss Irene Fishba. The Director, Stakeholder of Engagement and Communications of RSPO. Please give a round of applause for Ms. Irene Fishba. Thank you for joining us. Please take a seat, ma'am. And our fourth speaker, our fourth panelist, is Ms. Dia Suradireja from SPOS Kahati. Can I give a round of applause for Ms. Dia Suradireja? Likewise, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Mr. Duinanto. So we'll, we'll be jumping in the talk show and also the dialogue for this afternoon, our second session. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, please do feel free to ask the questions to our panelists and also our speakers. For those of you who are joining us virtually, please do access the Slido. And for those of you who are here at the Borobudur Hotel, you may prepare your questions because we will be having a question and answer session at the end of the talk show or our dialogue. So I would like to jump in to Mr. Duinanto. Mr. Duinanto, to give us a, a clear understanding and also a perspective this afternoon, can you please tell us what is the current state of the global food climate and also energy crisis and the geopolitical situations that the global is facing right now? Can you please tell us on the condition that we are facing? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Moderator, and a uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first, I would like to extend my uh, highest appreciation to the organizer for having me here. Although I'm online, but uh, I am very much hope that we have we will have a fruitful discussion uh, this afternoon. And uh, also sending uh, convey uh, the best regard from uh, our Director General for Motor Cooperation, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, and also our, my Director for uh, Development, Economic, and Environmental Affairs. Uh, as uh, uh, we all know that after uh, two years of fighting uh, COVID-19, the world economy has uh, been left in a fragile state. And uh, as the war Ukraine, uh, in Ukraine erupted, the global average uh, growth prospects have been revised uh, downward. The COVID-19 pandemic and war in Ukraine uh, is sending uh, shocks to the world economy. Our countries uh, will be affected by the crisis, but Developing countries are already hit by the COVID-19 pandemic rising uh, debt and climate challenge change will be hit uh, uh, harder uh, by disruption in food, fuel, and finance. Uh, the lingering effects uh, uh, are likely to further increase the number of poor and create significant challenges to the realization of uh, global food security. The ability of countries and people uh, to deal uh, with adversity has therefore also been eroding. Today, 60% of workers around the world uh, have lower uh, real incomes uh, than before. The FAO, for example, for, uh, in food price index, uh, is showing that it's near at record levels, and 20.8% uh, 
higher than uh, this time last year. Worldwide, more people have faced severe hunger emergencies. Uh, in energy sectors, the energy market volatility has increased uh, that will lead to higher energy prices in the medium and long term. Crude oil has now reached over 120 US dollar per barrel and energy prices overall are expected to rise uh, by 50% in 2022 uh, relative to in uh, 2021. The achievement of the SDGs target, especially SDG 7, seems still lack of the track and has not met the expected target. Uh, Indonesia emphasized the importance of the energy transition uh, and includes the dimension of development and needs to go hand in hand with energy security, accessibility, and affordability. Indonesia is open uh, for international cooperation, good investment in innovative funding and technology transfer. On climate, uh, the global efforts to tackle climate change also facing many challenges. Through, uh, although there has been no empiric data or uh, response to this, but many competent parties believe that there are potential risks of the pandemic and conflict toward the climate action. Uh, Indonesia is also committed to Paris Agreement, underlines the necessity of full and effective impact of the agreement. Indonesia climate action, uh, maybe we already hear it uh, from this morning session that we, uh, from the, our NDC, we have committed to reduce greenhouse gases of uh, 29% by uh, our own efforts and 41% uh, with internet support by 2030. So the main trans uh, mission channels generate uh, these all effects uh, rising, uh, are rising food prices, rising energy prices, tightening financial conditions, and each of these elements can have important effects on uh, its own, but they can also feed uh, into each other creating vicious cycles, something that unfortunately is already starting. In one way or another, everyone is exposed to the impacts of climate change, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the soap waves of the ukraine uh, russia conflict, uh, which pose great challenges in the developing world. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Duinanto. And I would like to also ask the research that probably have been, that have been conducted by Professor Harry Pronomo here regarding the current state of the global political geopolitical situation and on the crisis that we are all facing what is it like professor uh, terima kasih mbak sara speak in indonesian silakan prof jadi ada empat ya empat key driver dari food insecurity pertama itu adalah konflik konflik dan kita menyaksikan konflik yang luar biasa antara rusia dan ukraina Dan saya tadi malam membuka beberapa harga, ya. harga minyak naik, harga gas apa LNG naik, harga gandum naik, harga jagung naik. Ya. Itu setelah terjadinya konflik ya, antara Ukraina dan Rusia. Ya. Beberapa menyebut invasi dari Rusia, ya. tetapi saya harus politikly netral menyebut itu ada konflik antara Rusia dan Ukraina karena apa karena uh, global supply chains kita cukup fragile gitu ya jadi begitu ada hambatan pasokan dari Ukraina dan uh, Rusia karena Rusia kena sanksi oleh Amerika dan EU maka pasokan energi dan gas bahkan ke negara seperti Jerman ya, itu juga apa, terkena dampaknya ya. bayangkan negara-negara di Afrika Utara ya, negara di Eropa Timur yang sangat tergantung kepada gas-gas Rusia itu sangat sangat menderita ya jadi pertama konflik kedua adalah climate ya. climate kita melihat uh, banyaknya gagal panen bahkan di di Cina ya di Cina yang selama ini cukup apa um, cukup stabil tapi dengan climate crisis itu banyak yang gagal panen sehingga ketika Cina dengan 1,3 miliar orang itu gagal panen kebayang itu demand dari penduduk Cina akan meningkat dan tentu itu akan meningkatkan um, harga dan itu menimbulkan krisis ya bagi orang-orang yang miskin ya kan krisis itu bagi orang-orang yang miskin 
bagi orang-orang yang kaya ya biasa saja harga minyak goreng naik dari 14.000 sampai 30.000 ya itu, itu berapa dolar sih oh, tinggal 2 dolar 1 dolar 2 dolar enggak enggak krisis ya jadi poverty itu juga driver dari um, dari uh, food insecurity dan terakhir adalah inequality ya. sebenarnya pasokan pangan itu cukup ya sekarang penduduk bumi itu 7,8 miliar diperkirakan kesediaan pangan itu cukup untuk 9 miliar ya. tetapi kan tidak semua orang punya akses yang sama gitu ya orang-orang yang nggak punya power nggak punya daya beli nggak punya akses ya. jadi itu sebabnya krisis buat beberapa orang ya tapi tidak semua mengalami krisis itu dan inequality kadang-kadang begini juga ya Orang yang makannya dua piring itu sekarang harus makan satu piring itu krisis ya. Tapi orang yang biasa makan satu piring itu jadi setengah piring itu acute. Oh, Terima kasih Mbak Zara. Baik. Terima kasih uh, Prof. Harry. And yes, what has been mentioned by Prof. Harry before, there are four key drivers of food insecurity which is conflict, climate, poverty and also inequality. And we'd like to know more besides food insecurity, we'll, we'll also be talking more about the global sustainability, especially of the vegetable oil markets, trade, and also the environmental aspect of palm oil itself. And I'd like to further dig the insights from Ms. Irene Fishba regarding this. What does the global food, climate, and also energy crisis has on the impact of those global sustainability, especially the vegetable oil markets, Ms. Fishba? Good afternoon, everyone, and Good thank afternoon. you for the question. That's a very important one. Um, I mean, the world is still disrupted, as we have heard. I mean, the different crises are still going on. But I think despite all these negative outlooks, we should not forget what we have reached in terms of sustainability um, over the last years, especially also with regard to the palm oil sector. Um, and when I look at, uh, at our figures, for, from the last two or three years. Interestingly, during COVID and now also in the first few months of this year, um, we have seen an increase in the production um, and procurement of certified sustainable palm oil. And we have also seen an increase um, in the uptake, even though the uptake has been a bit slower, but overall um, the numbers are are actually very, um, are making me very optimistic so that countries and organizations are really staying to their sustainability commitments and they follow this path. And this gives me hope also going forward. And I think we should really not forget despite everything that might still come um, that we have made these commitments towards sustainability and we should stay on, on these paths. And I think, I mean, the current situation with the high palm oil prices are also an opportunity, especially for the grower companies. It's an opportunity to invest in more sustainable products or in more ethical products. And it's also an opportunity for all of us to look at the smallholders, to work with smallholders, to, to invest in them, to help their, to build their capacity to support them um, financially. So it's actually also, despite all the crisis, I think it's a good moment in time for us to reflect how we want to go forward. And we should take, we should look at what we have reached and take this good energy going forward. From your perspective for what we have reached, what are the gaps that we need to fill? I mean, there is still a lot to do, of yes. course. I mean, especially with regard to sust certified sustainable palm oil. If we look at the global production and global consumption, certified sustainable palm oil, as we have heard this morning, is just around a fifth of the global production. And of course, I mean, we want to make um, the palm oil sector more sustainable. We want to transform markets. And our vision is to have 100% sustainable, certified sustainable palm oil um, in the future. And in this perspective, there is still a lot to do with regard to um, production, but also with regard to consumption of certified sustainable palm oil. 
All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Fishba. And we'll be discussing it further during the session, but I would like to also ask Ms. Dia uh, regarding your perspective on the impacts of our current global condition and what it has on the vegetable oil markets and the sustainability and environmental impacts. Okay, uh, thank you. I just talked to uh, uh, Henry about this question. Is because it is very, you know, it's not general, but it is a little bit tricky one. It is, uh, I think, uh, with the status of food, climate, and energy crisis, that the over time in increasing worrying. Ini meningkatkan kekhawatiran. So I think the question about the environmental aspect is often overlook yeah because if we see if you uh, asking uh, yeah asking about what the impact in uh, in the palm oil i think uh, is it uh, we can see not only about the how the palm oil itself to give impact in the environmental but we have to see that because the vegetable oil demand and production is projected to continue to grow particularly in developing region uh, in line with the rising uh, per capita income and then i think what indonesia uh, indonesia looking for the the impact if we see the impact yeah of course for the food uh, climate and uh, energy crisis we are in indonesia is like the under pressure with the with the issues because always coming the issues is coming for deforestation issues uh, i think uh, this is one thing that the impact because we are in indonesia still have the uh, weaknesses about the data about the historical why the uh, palm oil is growing in indonesia because in the historical and then yeah if we uh, if we see in the for session, all the speakers see that is this, uh, you know, uh, is this the the one of the our uh, giving the economic impact. But for the en environmental, I think we still have the stigma about the uh, deforestation uh, after the uh, about the uh, uh, land. So I think, uh, however, some uh, research have also shown the ex function of the vegetable oil production in area of the low native carbon stock for example if you uh, uh, <coughs> if we see the, the, the climate issues so I think uh, what uh, uh, I'm saying is this uh, if uh, we can uh, we see is very general you know uh, uh, general input if bringing the palm oil impact to the environment to the food and climate and uh, 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 and uh, crisis I think uh, is this for us is this the impact is uh, the climate issues could hold the big, big threat I think a uh, threat and then with the increasing frequency and uh, severity of extreme weather over time and then I think it is the uh, inevitable change in ecology, uh, ecological cycle with the unstable yield or productivity of palm oil. I think with, uh, with the minimal adaptation strategies and unstable uh, or even low productivity palm oil, it would be hard uh, for us to meet in the vegetable oil demand. So uh, this is can encourage uh, encourage the company also small farmer to carry out land expansion to meet the needs of the vegetable oil. All right. Thank you, uh, Ms. Suradireja. And Properi, what are your views? Because it has been mentioned before, sudah dikatakan bahwa selain impact, impact atau dampak ekonomi, ada juga dampak lingkungan. Ini bagaimana dari kacamata Anda sebagai seorang peneliti ini untuk menanggapi? Pertama, um, saya ingin ke konstitusi kita. Ya. Saya suka mengutip konstitusi kita, Undang-Undang Dasar 1945, melihat pasal 33 ayat 4. Ya itu sangat eksplisit, kristal clear 
bahwa sustainable development ya, um, berwawasan lingkungan itu ada di situ ya bahwa perekonomian kita itu harus disusun berwawasan lingkungan dan berkelanjutan itu pesan konstitusi gitu ya jadi regardless food crisis ya, regardless apalagi climate change ya kita harus berkontribusi regardless energy crisis kita harus tetap ya bahwa istiqomah dengan sustainable development ya di, di dan di, di pasal 28 uh, ayat H1 ini Ibu Menteri suka mengutip bahwa lingkungan yang baik itu hak setiap warga negara gitu ya jadi sawit yang berwawasan lingkungan itu juga hak bagi saya sebagai warga negara ya dan kita sepakat bahwa itu yang harus kita lewati dan I believe, ya, saya percaya gitu ya, bahwa um, kita bisa menjadikan apa, food crisis, energy crisis itu sebagai opportunity for us ya, to be very very competitive ya, bisa menjadi competitive advantage ya, bagi sawit kita. Jadi kalau kita bisa melewati ini, tidak rusak-rusakan di lingkungan ya, kita bisa mengembangkan dengan baik, maka kita bukan jadi victim, bukan jadi korban ya dari food crisis, energy crisis, tapi kita jadi winner. Bahwa apapun yang terjadi, kita karena pesan konstitusi kita, kita ingin sustainability, dan saya yakin kita bisa gitu ya. Jalannya itu cukup jelas, bahwa ada masalah di sana sini, iya. Tetapi itulah mengapa kita ada ya Mbak Dia ya. Why we exist ya, yeah. we struggling for that sustainable for long time. So, um, I will not give up gitu ya. With the food crisis, energy crisis, we stay in the sustainable of palm oil development. And my belief, we can do, I believe the government in the right direction, even corruption still there ya. Yeah. But uh, weakness, uh, weak governance, but we, we, we can do it. Yeah. And also the private sector, yeah. we believe step by step. Yeah. Even Pak Oka just heard the environmental sustainability, yeah. but I think we can make progress yeah. step by step to make sure that yeah. private sector, the small holder yes. can yeah. go in the right direction to sustainable way and sustainability become our competitive yeah. advantage for the oil sector. Yeah. Sustainability as a competitive advantage. Budia, you'd like to add? Ya, yeah, uh, saya pikir saya sedikit menambahkan. Jadi kalau uh, apa? Uh, ya, karena saya mengikuti perbaikan dari uh, apa sektor uh, kelapa sawit dan saya melihat bahwa effort dari pemerintah yang didorong terus oleh uh, para pihak. Uh, pengusaha, asosiasi, ini effortnya sudah cukup bagus. Artinya pada saat uh, ISPO, Indonesia Sustainable Palm Oil Sertifikasi ini menjadi sebuah instrumen untuk perbaikan tata kelola dan ini presiden langsungnya tanda tangan sebagai sebuah sistem, saya pikir ini adalah satu penggerak. Jadi kalau dikaitkan dengan uh, pangan, dengan climate, dengan krisis yang sekarang, ini sebetulnya menjawab. Jadi hanya sayang banyak orang tidak membaca dengan detail. Jadi me, apa melihatnya uh, sepintas tetapi tidak melihat bahwa effort ini ada. Itu yang pertama. Dan yang kedua, pemerintah juga langsung menginstru, uh, menginstruksikan semua kementerian, lembaga untuk memiliki Uh, untuk bekerja membangun rencana aksi nasional untuk perbaikan uh, uh, apa kelapa sawit. Ini kenapa? Jadi uh, apa uh, selalu ditanya kenapa impres? Karena instruksi, instruksi langsung kepada uh, apa uh, kementerian dan lembaga. Walaupun tidak mudah menjalankan, karena instruksi ini bisa diabaikan, bisa uh, menjadi hal yang oke okay, ada impres, sowat. Tetapi ini tidak di, uh, hampir mem, apa, uh, mendorong untuk uh, setiap uh, kementerian, lembaga membuat perencanaan dan anggaran untuk pelaksanaan ini tidak semudah membalikan tangan. Ini jadi ini proses di kita juga. Tantangan ya. utamanya di mana Ibu? Tantangan utamanya kembali kepada kepedulian 
kita semua. Kepedulian. Ya, kalau saya melihat, jadi misalnya pelaksanaan rencana aksi nasional, aksi daerah, saya melihat ini kepedulian dari kita. Kalau mereka melihat hal ini strategis untuk perbaikan, kelihatan effortnya. Tetapi kalau ini hanya sebagai kebijakan, jadi segala sesuatu memang saya melihat ini ke, apa susah sekali menjadi mencari champions dalam kebijakan-kebijakan effort pemerintah. Nah, pada saat uh, instrumen pasar bermain, jadi seperti RSPO ini uh, instrumen pasar voluntary uh, dan uh, apa uh, uh, sertifikasi lain yang voluntary, ini seperti mereka hanya melihat insentif. Padahal ini bukan hanya insentif, ini perbaikan. Jadi uh, apa mengkaitkan tadi impactnya terhadap uh, isu uh, food uh, dan uh, uh, krisis pangan ini saya pikir uh, secara uh, tools atau kebijakan ini saya sampai bilang ini kurang apa ya tapi kembali saya pikir kepada uh, uh, kita semua pelaku pun uh, harus harus berubah dan termasuk petani juga ini di sini ada kawan-kawan uh, apa uh, dari asosiasi petani uh, merubah merubah perilaku saya merubah pikir. perilaku dengan ya. itu ya harus terus mengingatkan kembali meningkatkan kepedulian kita ya. Karena baik lagi, sustainability ada dalam undang-undang dasar kita. Dan also it is about buyer, ya. yes. buyer, buyer, and buyer. Yes. Not only addressing the producer, smallholder, and corporation, but us. Ya. Yes. If we stop buying uncertified ya, minyak goreng, ya, then solve the, all of the problem. Yeah. Ya. But just need a more money yeah. to do it. <laughs> Back to our responsibility as buyers as well. And okay, I would like to ask Ms. Fishbein also uh, push further regarding the sustainability issues of you know of our of the industry itself. From your perspective, what impact does it have to the global uh, sustainable palm oil market itself? I would just like to add on what has been said before, and then I'm gonna gonna please answer do, the question. I mean, I, I mean, I, I think the challenges are huge for everyone, anyways, and I mean, no one or no sector can solve the challenges alone. And therefore, I very much like what has been said. Um, it needs the collaboration between the government. They need to set the right policies, the private sector, civil society, and this is why it's really important that we all address the challenges. Um, jointly and we work together and with regard to RSPO it has been mentioned um, the specificities between our um, of RSPO yes. and ISPO for example so we don't look at the different schemes as competitors yeah. actually um, there are a lot of similarities and the schemes are um, supplementary so the ISPO is a government-driven scheme, and while RSPO, as you mentioned, is a voluntary um, certification scheme that depends on its members that come all from, from all across the palm oil sector. But there is, we have started better collaboration with ISPO, with MSPO, with the governments in Indonesia and in Malaysia, and I think we have to foster our collaboration in order um, to really move ahead and make the sector more sustainable. Okay, so and to, now. <laughs> yes, fostering the collaboration yeah. Yeah, between all stakeholders. Okay, probably we also like to ask Mr. Duinanto, would you like to add also your views? Are you still with us? Sorry, the connection is not very good. Can, can you repeat the question again? Thanks. Uh, yes, Mr. Duinanto, we were just discussing about how to foster sustainability especially uh, here in Indonesia, to also promote the condition and also have, there have been improvement, as mentioned before, but how to really improve and also foster sustainability and also the cooperation between all stakeholders? Yeah, yes, uh, I think uh, it's already mentioned actually by other panelists, but uh, I just would like to underline again that the vegetable oil uh, sectors plays a crucial role in supporting the growth of the world economy and trade. For example, well, the global demand of vegetable oil is projected to expand by 33 metric tons by uh, 2030. Therefore, the uh, ensuring sustainable future of our next uh, generation will hinge on our ability to produce enough uh, sustainable oil. Uh, to this end, it is important to acknowledge uh, as well the concrete steps that mentioned by Ibu, so, uh, that is Atia, that have been taken to further promote sustainability of the uh, palm oil. 
the biggest as the biggest uh, producer of palm oil, uh, Indonesia remains committed to realize sustainable production of palm oil through a comprehensive policy framework which involves multi stakeholders cooperation and uh, very uh, more the most important is the implementation uh, in the field. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Dwi Nanto. And before I jump into the question and answer session, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to also remind you that for those of you who are here offline, you may propose your questions through Slido. And for those of you virtually, please do access it through Slido by scanning the barcode. And we will also be having a, a session later for those of you who are here to prepare your questions to be asked directly to our speakers. But before we jump into the question and answer session for this second session, I would like to ask to all of our speakers um, today here, Bapak dan Ibu yang sudah hadir, what are the measures implemented or probably potentially to be implemented by the stakeholders? Because we have mentioned that it needs collaboration. We need, you know, fostering sustainability it needs a very high collaboration from all stakeholders. What measures should be implemented and especially by stakeholders to address the palm oil sustainability in light of the crisis that we are facing right now, regardless if it's food, energy or even climate? And probably we could like to ask Mr. Wisnu Lombardwinanto to express your thoughts on this issue first. I'm sorry that the connection is, is still... Uh, can you uh, repeat again the question? Thanks. No worries, Mr. Dwinanto. Um, what measures can or should be implemented by key global stakeholders to address the palm oil sustainability? especially regardless are facing the crisis that the globe is facing right now. Mr. Duinanto. Yes, uh, thank you. I think uh, such cooperation uh, may, uh, may cover uh, or uh, be focused on activities of a common interest, such as the uh, promoting of the uh, application of holistic and non-discriminatory principle, or sustainable uh, for all types of vegetable and, and the others. And uh, we also uh, have to uh, bear in mind that uh, despite the, the strategic uh, importance and positive contribution to achieving the, the sustainable development, uh, we noted that there's still, unfortunately, uh, palm oil continues to be the uh, target uh, for a negative uh, campaign, but we have to deal with it uh, wisely. and. Uh, we must uh, refrain from using the, the, the sustainability principle as a cover to guise of trade protectionism that leads to uh, complete punishment of certain types of uh, vegetable oils. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, domestically, we will uh, try to improve uh, to meet all the, the sustainability criteria, uh, including an environmental uh, safe uh, to, to uh, make a, a better uh, palm oil uh, industry in Indonesia. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Duinanto. And next, I would like to also ask the same question to Ms. Fishba. I think it's very important now that um, I, I look at our members especially, and now that um, some of our members have to find alternative supply for sustainable palm oil this, um, due to the crisis. I mean, they cannot source sunflower oil, for example, and need to switch. Um, their supplies and I think it's very important that we adhere to our high standards that we don't deviate from our standards even though it might be a bit challenging but we need to to really um, stick at least to the level that we have we are currently even in a standards um, revision process because we need to revise our standards every five years we need to adjust them to the current circumstances so I think it's, it's really important that we uphold our standards um, and that, that, the mem that we work with our members to enable them um, to stick um, to these high standards. Because if we, if we don't stick to the standards, the damages for the environment and also social damages would even be um, worse than it is. All right, that means sticking to the high standards. Mm -hmm just to make sure and to make sure and to ensure the sustainability and also the good environment that we yeah. have yeah. okay uphold throughout this time thank you miss fishba and uh, budia yeah I, uh, uh, in the long run from indonesia <laughs> yeah in the long run from indonesia point of view uh, of view i think we are still fighting 
uh, for recognizing of the national scheme in the global market. It's not easy process. Uh, yeah, uh, Indonesian is all, not only from the government side, also the civil society and then also the association still fighting to have the recognition uh, in the global market. We want to see a uh, yeah, more welcoming view from the buyer countries about the Indonesian uh, palm oil policy and effort until now. We, we still struggling. And then uh, for me, the step is very important is uh, opening dialogue between uh, consumer or buyers and uh, producer countries like Indonesia and Malaysia to the, this is very important step. And then I think now Indonesia is uh, have the opportunity co-chairing the dialogue between uh, buyer countries and then we are in the uh, producing countries in the uh, fact dialogue. Forest, agriculture, and commodity trade. I think it is a good step for Indonesia uh, chairing with the UK uh, government in the dialogue. Because in the dialogue is very open to uh, discuss about the, uh, first is about the trade and market, we uh, we have the uh, scheme like SVLK, system uh, verifikasi legalitas kayu uh, system that it is proven by uh, EU and uh, UK. And then the second is about the uh, smallholder supporting because if we 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 agreed in and from also from the uh, first session is we are now have the smallholders uh, effort to uh, support and then the third is about the uh, transparency and uh, traceability is this the the i think is it the principle also for us for the ispo ispo to have the traceability then, uh, and then uh, 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 transformation. And then the, the last is about the uh, research and innovation. I think, uh, yeah, I think from Brin also is very open to have the uh, uh, research uh, in, uh, and innovation. And then I think it is quite a good step for us, yeah. Uh, become the, yeah, it is trying again to have the uh, global market recognition for yes. the ISPO. Thank you. All right, that means we have to move forward with the dialogues, the transparency and traceability, and also the uh, research and also innovation that we have to boost in order for going forward and going to the future. And Professor Harry Pernamo, from your point of view. Yeah, um, from the global buyers and, and also uh, national stakeholders sharing the, the green premium because transforming the current situation into more sustainable palm oil, as you say, only 19% certified by RSPO, will quite costly. Eh? So um, the, the buyer have to pay as well as the producer. So sharing, as Pa Agus Puno mentioned, the buyer have to pay more eh, for sustainable palm oil, and the, the producer is willing to produce more sustainable palm oil Certification is, there is some cost for certification, and this is the cost of buyer, and also the cost of uh, producer. Mm -hmm. And the second one, why don't Indonesia be the champion yeah, for sustainable palm oil? Yeah? Not only um, 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 following the, if other countries not manage environment sustainably, why should we? Yeah? But, uh, if Pak Jokowi want to Indonesia be leader, yeah? why not in palm oil? Yeah? We become the leader, the champion of sustainable palm oil in the world. Yeah? I think it's an opportunity, a big opportunity for us. Thank you. Thank you. And in order to achieve that, Prof. Harry, what is important for Indonesia to do going forward since we are speaking of roadmap to become the champion? Yeah, the first, we have to solve the illegality of land. Yeah? We have to uh, increase the uh, productivity for smallholders. We have to uh, make low work for corporation. And sometimes the, the, the bad guys is not the corporation or smallholders, but at the middle, yeah, the chukong. Yeah. The chukong, those who have uh, 
hundred hectare of oil palm. Eh. Small holder usually as FD as uh, indigenous people, yeah, real farmer, they, they follow the, the government because they are afraid. Eh. FD is a big, big company. Eh. They are also exposed to the international um, market. Eh. But how about at the middle? Eh, those who are strong enough, the Okdum, Okdum from university, from uh, police, from army, from parliament, yeah, it's a lot actually. Yeah. It's a lot of oknum, oknum that difficult yeah, to, to, to make law work yeah, for that oknum. Yeah. So small case sometimes uh, easy. That's why uh, under Threat Hub we propose yeah, the definition of small scale is not under 25 hectare, yes. but under 6 hectare. This according to Sony Mumbuna and Pak Agus Andrianto research, research. Because 25 hectare is not for smallholder anymore. It's for the mid-size. Yeah. So again, the big corporation is exposed. They, they tend to follow the regulation. And the small smallholder, they are afraid. They tend to follow the government. But at the middle, yeah, Sambu, FRD Sambu. <laughs> so at the middle, it's yes. quite difficult sometimes yeah, to, to make law work. Yeah. Thank you. And those problems, and we have to eliminate all those middle, middle people, or, or Oknum or Chukong, as you mentioned. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen. And now we have come to the question and answer session. And for the committee, I would like to please ask your help to open the Slido. And for those of you who are here, Baba dan Ibu yang hadis langsung, you may propose a question. Are there any questions that would like to be presented? All right, ladies and gentlemen, for the committee, please prepare the microphone. Silakan. Berdiri, menyebutkan nama, dan juga untuk siapa pertanyaan ditujukan. Silakan. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tanya. Uh, I'm doctoral researcher at the Natural Resources and Environmental Management at IPB. Uh, Professor Henry, Her, Professor Harry, student. Um, uh, uh, congratulations on this new trade initiative, and it's really interesting to talk about the global food crisis. And we see how this uh, global food crisis and how we weather it down in a national scope. And also see how the, see how the different approach given by the Malaysian government and Indonesian government in palm oil surge and prices. And we see how the Malaysian government can manage and control the prices when the uh, stock is actually uh, limited in the past uh, uh, semester of this year. So, uh, lesson learned what we see from uh, Malaysia's uh, palm oil governance is that actually they have this Malaysian Palm Oil Board or MPOB where they integrate all of the permits and necessaries uh, to conduct uh, palm oil governance in their country. While in Indonesia, here we see uh, the palm oil uh, administrations are handled by different and various ministries and uh, agencies. For example, the palm oil permits uh, is under the Ministry of Agriculture, the land use permits is under the Agrarian Ministry, uh, and also the palm oil trade is under the Ministry of Trade. Uh, we, uh, we see that this um, intersectoral administrations and also uh, the silo between uh, the institutions under the Indonesian government has caused uh, some uh, barriers or handles in controlling the whole uh, palm oil governance. So, uh, as Ibu Dia Suradireja mentions, that all the ministries and agencies have been given instructions to do um, coordinative efforts, but uh, whether the, the ideas of coordinating this palm oil administration, whether it's the permits, it's the trades, it's the productions, can be more coordinated. So, um, uh, uh, at last, uh, we would like to know whether this trade initiative is going to address the elephant uh, in the room or is going to be business as usual in the development project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Tanya. Can I have a big round of applause for our first question from Ms. Tanya? And next, we will pull the questions first and then we'll be answering the questions afterwards. The next question, I see it's still from the same table. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Suji Hariati and I'm from Council of Palm Oil Producing Countries. So, uh, one of our allies in European is European Palm Oil. Uh, Alliance or APOA, who share with us a data that 86% of palm oil of European palm oil imports was sustainable. 
So I'd like to know Ms. Fisbah view on this as a RSPO. How do you see, how do you view uh, this figure? You know, that 80 per 86% of palm oil imports in European is already sustainable. That's uh, the claim from APUA. I think that's my question. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Suchi Hariati. Are there any more questions from the floor or probably from Slido? Are there, are there any questions? Yes. Can we present the question up onto the screen? This is the first, uh, this is the question from Slido. Probably we can start the answering session in just a minute, starting from the question from Slido. Allow me to read the question. Bagaimana arah pengembangan perdagangan kelapa sawit ke depan, 5 dan 20 tahun? Negara mana menjadi destinasi ekspor paling prospektif untuk ekspor kelapa sawit? Atau apakah ekspor kelapa sawit ke depan diharapkan lebih terhilirisasi? Dari produksi nasional, berapa banyak yang diharapkan untuk ekspor dan untuk pemanfaatan dalam negeri? Now saja kita akan mulai. We will start the answer session. Probably we can start with this question that is being pulled online from Slido. Maybe we can start from Ibu Dia. We can answer. Silahkan Ibu Dia. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, Mbak Tania, I think you have the great questions. Yes. Yeah, because we we have another crucial thing. It's also, also in the alignment of the policy among the ministerial uh, is this is this one the how to say is this is this one of the still uh, PR kita our homework how to the Indonesian government among the ministry can together with working on this uh, issue uh, issue for the environmental about the forestry also uh, some commodities strategies and then uh, yeah, I think land-based uh, uh, land uh, development by commodity is is uh, you uh, you right about is this still still problem and then costly, and then uh, and then is uh, like Pa Harry mentioned too many sambo another sambo in the process. <laughs> so uh, saya tidak apa uh, tidak bisa menjawab how, how to solve the problem. Tetapi saya selalu uh, berpikir bahwa transparansi, transparansi dan traceability semua kebijakan terkait dengan lahan dan penggunaan lahan ini memang harus dibuka menjadi roadmap bersama untuk kita kawal perbaikannya. Itu mungkin uh, apa jawaban pertanyaan dari Mbak Tanya. Kalau yang kedua uh, saya pikir tentang EPOA, ya. uh, Ibu bisa uh, menjawab. Lalu kalau pertanyaan bagaimana arah pengembangan perdagangan kelapa sawit uh, ke depan, negara mana yang menjadi destinasi ekspor paling prospek untuk ekspor kelapa sawit? Saya rasa ini yang harus jawab kawan-kawan dari uh, apa? Dari uh, uh, industri ya, uh, dari uh, dari pelaku ada uh, apa? Mas Bungki juga. Ini kemana arahnya? Baik, yeah. Yeah, baik. Terima kasih, Ibu Dia. Dan Prof. Harry, you would like to add to Ms. Tanya's uh, question? Yeah, um, I think we will try to uh, respond the, the, the last question on the uh, perdagangan kelapa sawit. Ya. Sekarang yang paling banyak uh, mengimpor sawit kita adalah India dan Cina, ya, Pakistan. Ya. This is uh, part of the opportunity and also part of the problem mm -hmm. and part of the opportunity because their economy actually growing growing and growing and growing the economy of china and, and india not very much the economy of europe and uk or us but the economy of china and and india you know the china was uh, the growth was at, uh, double digit as well as uh, india so we have to uh, target yeah? um, not only the conventional market but also the uh, uncertified market with certified palm oil. I don't know how to do it, yeah? but try to, to sell the uh, certified uh, palm oil to uncertified um, market like uh, China and, and India and Pakistan, Egypt. Yeah? And we can be the, the leader, yeah? it's not only the follower, I mean if 
the country doesn't wa doesn't actually demand the uh, answer the certified why don't we try to sell the certified try to work together with them try to develop market with them and i believe yeah some millennials people yeah, some young generation in each country and my understanding it tend to be greener than the old generation yes. so maybe i am wrong but we, we we can we can try thank you brother. thank you very much uh, professor harry for the answer and now we'd like to continue to miss fishba especially in answering miss suchi hariati's question regarding the palm oil imports in the eu so I, I'm just I'm not sure whether I understood the question correctly. So you mentioned that um, eight, 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 or a poor publish, published that 86 percent of 86. the palm oil that is um, imported into Europe is already sustainable. It's already sustainable. And and what was the question then? I just want to know uh, how uh, SPO view uh, this data. Do you agree on that, or do you think the data is to overestimate or maybe underestimate? <laughs> So whether whether we find the data is yeah. how do you feel how do you see that that figure? Your views on the data. Uh, do you agree on that? Do you agree that eighty x eighty six percent of the palm oil? I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I mean, they have published published this figure. I, I don't think that the question is whether we agree or not. I mean, the, they they import. A, a big part, I mean, Europe is a big importer of palm oil, as we have heard this morning as well. And the big part of what they import, of the palm oil they import, um, is sustainable. But, but they, and they want to reach 100%. That's also part of the European Green Deal. Um, that, that's the big topic in the current European legislation. Um, they work on the current European due diligence um, legislation that will come into force sometime in the next um, year. Um, we work with our members to ensure that this legislation does not have a very negative impact, um, especially on smallholders. Um, so we are currently um, working also on a campaign in Europe um, to still try to influence the dialogue and to show what is happening in the grower countries and what impact it has in the grower countries, similar to what we have seen in the presentation this morning from Prof. Harry. Um, if this legislation is coming into force, it will have um, quite a big impact here in Indonesia. Um, and I'm sure most of the representatives in the European countries know this as well, but I think it's still verse um, to work with them and see what can be done um, that that they don't look at this legislation just from a European perspective because then it has negative impacts um, on other parts of the world yes. and in the end we want to leave no one behind that's also um, a big a very important topic in the European legislation that they want to be inclusive um, and I think it's, it's really important to to look at, yeah, at all the parts yes. um, of all the, the, the world and what impact yes. um, these legislations have. But I think it's a fact. I mean, it, it is a fact that um, Europe wants to work towards 100% um, import of sustainable palm oil. I think that is just something um, yeah. that, it, that, that we have to live with. And moving forward, it needs also communication in order to establish good cooperation on both sides and also can, and to benefit all stakeholders as well. All right, I hope it answers your question. Yes, I see a nod. And next, are there any more questions from the floor? I think we have more time for one more question. Info oh, there's another in additional information, silakan. Ada memberikan tanggapan dan juga memberikan informasi. Terima kasih atas yeah. waktu yang diberikan. Yeah. Kami sedikit tadi menjelaskan pertanyaan untuk Bu Dia terkait pasar ya. Ini kebetulan dari pers rilis dari GAPKI yang terakhir, memang setelah keran ekspor dibuka, Alhamdulillah ada peningkatan ya, peningkatan ekspor ke beberapa negara, terutama Pakistan, naik hampir dua kali lipat, kemudian EU juga naik, kemudian China naik, dan India kemarin juga 
delegasi Pak Mendak main ke India dan sudah menandatangani satu juta ton ya untuk CPO siap diekspor. Kemudian juga Afrika. Jadi ini yang sudah langsung dikirim ekspor setelah keran ekspor ditutup. Sekarang dibuka lagi. Kemudian kami sampaikan stok ya. Memang stok CPO sampai sekarang masih berlimpah. Ya kurang lebih 6.800 ton, juta ton ya. Eh 6 ya 6 juta ton, 6,8 juta ton. Padahal biasanya kalau reguler itu hanya sekitar 3,5 juta ton per bulan. Nah, kemudian waktu Mei itu ditutup, stok kita mencapai 7,2 juta ton. Ya, kemudian tadi juga ada yang nanya ya, komposisi kebutuhan konsumsi lokal. Untuk lokal ini antara untuk kebutuhan pangan dan biodiesel hampir berimbang. Untuk pangan itu 4,2 juta ton, guna untuk biodiesel 4,1. Jadi lebih banyak untuk pangannya. Guna oleh kimia ada sedikit 1,8 juta ton. Nah, kemudian untuk ekspor itu kita sudah memang industri hilir yang kita ekspor. Untuk ekspor itu yang terbesar memang untuk olahan CPO. Olahan CPO 8,6 juta ton. CPO hanya 314 ribu. Jadi selama ini ya sudah memang hilir, industri hilir yang kita uh, ekspor. Kemudian untuk biodiesel juga ada ekspor kecil 87 ribu. Oleh kimia 1, eh, 1 juta ton dan total ekspor sekarang 11 juta ton. Kemudian untuk produksi nasional hingga bulan posisi bulan Juni itu sudah mencapai 23 juta 500 ton. Jadi ini sudah on the track walaupun kemarin ada keluhan harga pupuk mahal sehingga petani kita banyak yang menjerit di, di samping harga TPS-nya turun, harga pupuknya naik sampai 2 3 kali. Ya ini juga akan mengganggu sustainability ya, karena mereka sangat berat untuk membeli pupuk. Tapi di satu sisi pendapatan mereka jatuh karena harga TPS. Nah, sekarang sudah berangsur naik, sudah mencapai di atas 2.000. Sedikitlah ini terima kasih atas kebijakan pemerintah yang kemarin sudah berubah dan ya. sudah positif Baik. untuk kita berharap sustainability bisa tercapai. Dan kemarin juga Komite Pengarah ISPO, Bapak Menteri Koordinator Perekonomian sudah menyampaikan bahwa Salah satu komitmen pemerintah adalah untuk percepatan sertifikasi ISPO bagi pekebun. Ya, Ini patut ya. kita dukung dan juga untuk PSR-nya. Terima kasih. Terima kasih juga dan butuh kerjasama seluruh pihak untuk bisa ya, mensuksikan hal tersebut. Terima kasih. Ada yang ingin menambahkan tanggapannya? Baik. Baik. As it seems, since the time is very tight, itu merupakan pertanyaan atau tanggapan terakhir. That was the last question that can be addressed. For this session and ladies and gentlemen can i have a bigger round of applause for all of our speakers for the second session thank you mr wisnu lombar duinanto please can you please have mr duinanto onto the screen again so i can thank him once again we can give a big round of applause for mr duinanto yes. thank you mr wisnu and thank you to professor dr harry purnomo as well thank you prof harry have a big round of applause Thank you, Ms. Irene Fishba, and also Ms. Dia Suradi Reja. Thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen.